Well, hi, and welcome to our second online service at Cedars Church. We're so glad that you could join us for this. And this has been another really tough week, I know, for many of you. Uh, some of you have got huge uh, stress in your workplaces. Some of you are working for the NHS uh, with enormous demands, and, and we thank you for being heroes at this time. Others of you are uh, no doubt anxious about your own health or your work situations or, or those that you love. But we come today to worship a God who is the same, always. Yesterday, today, forever, he will always be who he is, which is a God who reigns and a God who is good. And a God who is so worthy of our worship. And so we have this meeting because we want to bring him the worship he deserves. It felt a bit strange last week being uh, in the home of Chris and Paige and just having a handful of us there, but it feels even stranger uh, just filming this in front of, of, of Lydia. But it is so good that we can still meet together as God's people and we trust that you will be blessed by this message. Let me just uh, commit this time to God in prayer for us. Our Father in heaven, we come before you today to worship you, to recognise that you and you alone are God and worthy of our praise. We thank you, Lord, that nothing surprises you and nothing is out of your control. We thank you too that you are a gracious God, a loving God, and you've shown that love for us through sending your dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our saviour and the one that would bring us back to you. A God who would give his only son is a God in whom we can trust and we put our trust in you today. Father, I want to pray uh, for my brothers and sisters as they gather here. Lord, I pray for them uh, in their various situations and their various concerns that you might be pleased to bring peace to their hearts and that you might use this service to encourage them and strengthen them in faith. And we pray all these things in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, in a moment, Jake and Caroline are going to lead us in a couple of songs of worship. But before they do that, let me just read some words to you from the prophet Habakkuk, which say this, Though the fig tree does not bud, and though there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Let us now sing to this great sovereign God. Because he lives. 
this morning from Psalm 34. Uh, I'm going to be reading from the ESV version, so I'll just give you a moment to find that, and then we will read that together. That's Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, and listen. I will teach you to fear the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from seeking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Amen. I'm now going to have a time of prayer, and after that Jonathan will preach this to us. So uh, before we pray, um, just a couple of points um, that I'm going to pray on, but that I'd like you to um, try and pray about over the next week. So um, our NHS staff and the NHS in general, um, let's pray for them. They're doing a really great job at the moment. So, yeah, let's keep them all in our prayers. Um, those of us amongst us that are sick, um, but also those of us that we know who are sick too, um, especially those people who are in hospital that can't have any visitors come and see them. And also lonely people, those that are in hospital who can't have visitors, but those who are self-isolating at home on their own. Um, so yeah, let's pray for those people too. Um, and of course, those people who are worried about losing their jobs at this difficult time. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, so let's just keep all of these things in our prayer. So yeah, please join me in prayer um, and bow our heads together. Dear Lord, um, I thank you for the ability to, um, to be able to watch church like this. Thank you for the gift of technology. Thank you that we're able to sit in our homes uh, this morning and, and watch uh, Jonathan preach. Um, thank you that it shows that the church is not the building, but it's the people. We are the people of God. So I thank you for that. Um, I thank you that yeah, we can go about watching church in this way. Um, I just pray for... Um, for uh, strength and, and courage at this time, Lord. Thank you that you are um, above it all, that you are all powerful and that you are unchanging. This situation seems to just change constantly and so much uncertainty about it, but thank you, Lord, that you, you never change and that you're in control of this entire situation. I thank you for the NHS. I thank you for what an amazing gift it is. So many countries don't have that gift, but we do, Lord, so thank you for blessing us with that. Thank you for all of the incredible staff who work for the NHS. Um, I just pray that they would um, have strength, that you protect them at this time, um, but they'd also feel loved. I pray if there's anyone in the NHS who are Christians, I just pray that they would encourage their staff and their colleagues, but also that they would encourage the patients that they're, they're helping and treating, and that through this hard time you might um, bring some people to the Lord. Um, I also pray for the government at this really hard time. I pray for the Prime Minister. Um, I pray that you would help him to get better, given that he's been uh, diagnosed with coronavirus, um, and, I, and the rest of his cabinet too, that you protect them and that you would give them wisdom over the next few weeks as they have to make such uh, difficult decisions, Lord. I also pray um, for those of us who are ill. I pray that you would be with, uh, be with them that are sick, that you would help them to heal and get better. 
Um, I pray that you'd be with their families as well. Uh, and for those people that are in hospital who can't have visitors, that you'd be with them and that you would um, comfort them, that they would know peace. Um, and above all, um, people in hospital, but also people who are self-isolating, that we would know that you're with us, Lord. You're with us at all times. No matter how lonely we might feel, whether we're self-isolating with our families or on our own, that you're with us, Lord. You're always there. Um, and I pray that we would be comforted and encouraged by that. I also pray for those of us who are worried about losing their jobs. The uncertainty created by this situation is immense, but I pray that we would all know that you are in control, that you always provide for your people. Uh, you never give us trials that are worse than what we can deal with. And I pray that we would know that and that would really comfort us. Um, and also I pray for Jonathan this morning. I thank you that he can preach to us in this way, despite the fact that we're all in different places. Uh, I pray that you would help him to speak, and that you would speak through him, that your word would be alive, and that you would open our hearts to receive what you um, have laid on Jonathan's heart this morning. I pray that it would encourage us and strengthen us over the coming week before we meet again next Sunday. And yeah, I pray at this hard time that you would help us all to come together um, and really make the most of this great opportunity to meet digitally and remotely like this. So yeah, I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you will have picked up from the reading today, we are looking at Psalm 34, which is a psalm of praise to God for his goodness. And David begins by saying these words, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And based on those words, those words that say, I will praise God at all times, I've chosen to call this message unceasing praise. That is what David seeks to offer God, unceasing praise. And we're going to think about two main things today. That The first is that fact that I've just mentioned, that David has a heart to praise God in all circumstances. And the second thing I want us to think about is the fact that he could do that because his identity was found in God. And it's so important that our identity is found in God. And as we think about our identity in God, we'll see all sorts of benefits that flow from that. So we're going to get straight into it. Uh, and the first thing I want us to think about is a heart that praises God. That is what David had, a heart that praises God. I've already mentioned verse one, but let me say it again. He starts by saying this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That is quite a statement, isn't it? I think if we're honest, we would struggle to say that that is true of our lives, that we always have praise in our mouths. It, it can be hard to praise God. Maybe this week you found it hard to praise God in the midst of so much uncertainty and sadness. It, it, maybe you've struggled to see the goodness of God and would find it hard to say like David, I will bless the Lord at all times. So how can he do it? How can he say it? Was it that his life was, was just so easy? I mean, this is the kid that was chosen to be a king. This was the one who was able to defeat Goliath. Maybe everything he, he did just went well. Was that the case? Well, no, we saw even last time that David had many difficult circumstances. And that is certainly true when he wrote this psalm. We know that because it actually says that. If you look in your Bible, even above verse 1, you'll see the context of this psalm. It says this. Of David, when he changed his behaviour before Abimelech, so that he drove him out and he went away. Your translation might say something like he pretended to be insane. David pretended to be insane. That is the context of this psalm. So what on earth is going on? Well, we read about this story in 1 Samuel 21, and I'll try and sort of summarise it for you. I've just mentioned that, that, that David killed Goliath. We know that story so well. And Goliath was a Philistine who were the enemies of Israel. And David didn't just kill Goliath. David managed to kill many, and he became a bit of a celebrity in Israel. So much so that the women there started to, to sing a song about him, which said this, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. He became a sort of a figure, a bit like Justin Bieber. All the ladies loved him. They're singing this song, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Now, King Saul could have reacted well to that. He could have taken delight in that fact. I mean, after all, David had killed uh, Israel's enemies. He was fighting for King Saul. He was fighting for his army. So, so Saul could have been pleased by what David had done. But that wasn't how he reacted. 
He was filled with jealousy. He hated the fact that David was getting recognition over him. And so he was filled with rage and set out to kill David. Now this was astonishingly hard for David. David was a very loyal Israelite. He loved his country. He loved his king. Furthermore, David was married to Saul's daughter, Michal, and was best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. But Michal and Jonathan said to him, David, you need to run away. Our father's out to get you. And so David realised he had no option but to run. He had to flee from the land of Israel. And the only place he knew to go to was, was, was the land of Philistine. And so um, he, he hoped that as he went to the Philistine territory that he wouldn't be recognised. Perhaps he might be able to get a job there, start a new life there. But he appeared before the king there. And while he was there, people recognised him and said, this is the one that they're singing about. That song that says Saul has killed his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. Well, this is the David that has done that. And remember, he's standing in front of a Philistine king. So this king would no doubt be out to kill him straight away if, if this really was this David that, that they were saying it was. And so David realised he only had one option, and that was to act like a crazy man. And so he starts scratching the sides of the walls. He starts allowing saliva to flow down him. And the king does indeed say, this is a crazy man. Get him out of my presence. And so that's the context into which David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. He's essentially in exile, away from his family, away from his home. And he's just pretended to be a madman. And yet he still says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Now, also in this psalm, we see that he's not alone. There's lots of verses that, 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 that have a sort of corporate feel that say, let us praise God together. So who is this us that it's talking about? Well, David didn't obviously write that psalm in the presence of, of, of Abimelech. He did it after he'd got away. And where does he go to? Well, we read exactly where he went in, in 1 Samuel 22, which says this. The first two verses, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontentment gathered around him and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. So basically David found refuge in a cave in a place called Adullam and his family came down, but so too did lots of other people. And how are those people described? They are described as being in distress, in debt and discontented. Doesn't that summarise how so many are feeling today? Distressed, in debt and discontented. Our context might not be one where we gather in a cave. We wouldn't even be allowed to gather in a cave even if we wanted to. But it's certainly true that there are many in distress and in debt and discontent. You may even feel that yourself as you watch this. So David's writing this psalm trying to remind those who are suffering deeply that God is good. God is for them. God won't abandon them. And that whatever trials and tribulations they are going through, they should look to him and they should praise him. And we'll see later on that if they praise him, they will enjoy his peace. And not only will they enjoy his peace, but they will glorify God. And so we read in verse three, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I've chosen to preach today from the English Standard Version, the ESV, which is a slightly more literal uh, translation than the NIV. The NIV says glorify the Lord with me, uh, which is a, a good translation. But I like the ESV at times for, for being literal. And I like it in a number of cases in this psalm. And this is one of them. Magnify the Lord with me. We are called to magnify our God. Have you ever thought about what that means? Many of us have grown up as, as in Christian homes and we've sang songs about magnifying God. But have we ever stopped and thought, how do we, small little creatures, magnify this infinitely glorious God? Well, John Piper's got a really helpful illustration here. He, he says there's two types of magnification. You've got the, the microscope, which looks at something that's tiny and helps make it look bigger. We don't magnify God in that way. God is not tiny. But you've also got the telescope, which is looking at something which is enormous, 
which to our eyes is very small and the telescope helps us see a bit more of how glorious it is. It still is only scratching at the surface of how big it is, but it gives a greater glimpse. And Piper says that is how we are called to magnify God. It's not that we make him look bigger than he really is like a microscope. It's that presently people are blinded to his glory. Most of them don't even want to see his glory. But what God wants to do is so work in his people that they find great delight in him, that they bring glory to him, that they magnify him and people see God's glory in us. Of course, it's at an imperfect level. We are fallen sinners, but that is our calling to bring glory to God, to magnify him, to show how great he is. And so Piper says this, what is needed is a church, a people which magnifies God like a telescope, a church which causes others to stop thinking of God as small, but to think about him and see him as great as he really is. That is our calling to magnify God. How, how do we do that? Especially when we're suffering, how can we magnify God during such a tough season? Well, friends, it's precisely in suffering that we can magnify him most, because it's then that it shows if God is enough for us. Because, of course, if everything is going well, then it's easy to praise God, isn't it? But it's when life is hard, when days are uncertain and difficult, that, that we see, is God truly precious to us? Is he really valuable to us? Do we find our satisfaction in him? Can we say, like David, I will bless the Lord at all times? Because if we do, then we are magnifying God. We are showing a glimpse of how glorious he is. Now, in order to do all of this, we need to have an identity that is deeply, deeply rooted in God. That was what David enabled David to praise God at all times. And that's the second thing that I want us to think about today, an identity rooted in God. All that David writes and the reason that he can praise God is rooted in the fact that he is deeply aware that his identity is found in God. And so in verse two, he says this, my soul will boast in the Lord. My soul will boast in the Lord. His identity is in God. He's boasting in him. Often as human beings, we want to boast in our own achievements, don't we? And certainly David could have become arrogant in that way. He was the one we remember that the women were singing about. That could have easily gone to his head. And he did many other good things too that could have made him arrogant, like Saul, but it didn't. David remained humble, and while Saul was eaten up by jealousy, David was pointing to the Lord, saying, I boast in him, my identity is found in him. And because he did that, he found great liberty. While, while Saul was bound up in, in this desire to be great and have a great name for himself, David had a desire to make God's name great. And that brought him great liberty. And this truth of finding our identity in God is our greatest need at the moment, friends. We are living in a time where people feel rocked. Their lives are rocked. And that probably includes us as Christians. We can be honest about that. We are feeling troubled at this time. These are difficult days. And friends, even our Saviour knew that. Even our Saviour experienced some of the things we're feeling now. His soul was troubled as he sat in that garden of Gethsemane. But although both believers and non-believers will experience anxiety, there is a difference, friends, for us if we are in Christ, because a non-believer finds their identity in what they do and in being in control. And at this time, they've got nowhere to go. At this time, they feel shattered because if your identity is found in what you do and having a sense of being in control, then you've got nowhere to go. But as Christians, we, although we're faced with the temptation to be like that, we need to know that our identity is to be found in God so that we can say like David, I will boast in him. And friends, let me tell you, when we find our identity in God, it is the path to liberation and there are so many blessings that come from it. This psalm is filled with blessings that come for a soul that finds its identity in God. And I want us to spend some time thinking about some of those blessings that are seen in this text. 
Now this psalm was written in Hebrew uh, and this particular psalm is what we call an alphabetic acrostic psalm. What that means is you've got each line begins with a different letter of the alphabet. So the Hebrew alphabet is uh, Aleph, Beit, Gimel and so each line begins with one of those. It's like an A to Z. Maybe at school you had to write a poem like that where each line begins with a different letter. Well, that's what he's done as he writes this psalm. It's a way of making it more memorable. It's a way of making it more poetically uh, beautiful. Each line beginning with a different letter of the alphabet. And in our Bibles, when we uh, have the translation, where we don't have that with each letter beginning with a uh, with each uh, sorry line beginning with a different letter, I feel like we kind of lose a little bit of the beauty of it. And so what I decided to do when I, I, I made this sermon was to not spell out A to Z, not write 26 uh, points, but to, to, to bring out six using the word praise. So what I'm going to do is think about the letters P, R, A, I, S and E and see some benefits we see from this psalm that begin with those letters. The first one is this, peace for those who seek. Peace for those who seek. Verse four says this, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Now we live in a time of real fear and David clearly felt that too at times. He, he says he sought the Lord, he delivered me from my fears. He'd known what it was to fear people. But here David shows that if we turn to God, if we seek him, we can know that he can deliver us from our fears and bring us peace. How does he do that? Well, because even though our lives might seem out of control, the truth is they are not. They are held in the hands of Almighty God who has a father-like care for his children. He knows our needs and he promises to provide for them. So as you journey through concerns about health and finances and other stresses, you can seek him and he can deliver you from your fears. Look to him and say, Lord, in this world where many are despairing, I will remind myself that my life is in your hands and you can deliver me from all my fears and bring peace. So that's the P, peace for those who seek him. Now, next in our, our word praise, is this radiance for those who look to him the letter r radiance there is radiance for those who look to him look with me at verse five those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed now i don't know if anyone has ever said to you you look radiant uh, perhaps it would feel a bit weird if they did especially i think for us blokes it would be a bit strange if someone says well you look radiant well what does it mean well, friends, we've just said that we can know peace from God, even in the worst of situations. And when we do that, there's something that sort of shines through. The presence of God shines through someone who is suffering and yet still finds hope in God. In a, a seemingly hopeless circumstance, if someone remains hopeful because of God, his light is shining upon them. And no doubt many of us have met people who are suffering who know the Lord dearly, and there's something radiant about them. So in these challenging days, those who find their identity in God will stand out as lights. They will radiate in these dark times, bringing hope to the hopeless. Friends, our God is a God of light, and when we look to him, his light shines upon us. There is radiance for those who look to him. So we've done P and R. Next up is A. And the word is abundance, abundance for those who taste of him. This is based on verse eight, which says this, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. You get to taste God, you get to see God, and there's blessing. It's language of abundance, isn't it? But what does it mean to taste and see God? How do we taste God? I mean, it sounds strange, doesn't it? Well, I think it partly relates to this, that God in his word has revealed himself and he's revealed how he wants us to live. And when we live in accordance with his word, it's the path to life and fulfillment and joy. Try God's way and you'll see that it is best. 
Now our hearts naturally go away from God. We are sinners and we, we, we are sinners by nature, but also sinners by choice. And we often try and find our joy outside of God. But actually, friends, although those uh, empty promises in the world might bring some temporary joy, they don't really give us lasting joy. Only God can give us that. Now hear me correctly, I'm not saying that if you come to Jesus suddenly everything becomes easy, it doesn't. But there is something about going God's way that enables us to, to find peace and joy even in the worst of situations. We can taste and see that he is good even when things around us are not as we wish them to be. Remember David is writing this probably from a cave, away from his homeland, having just pretended to be crazy. Yet even in that context, he can say, taste and see that the Lord is good. His joy remains, even though life is hard. And he says to us, you've got to taste this God. You've got to see his glory. And when you do, you will know an abundance of blessing. Next up is the letter I, and the word is interest. And by interest, I don't mean the kind that you get in the bank. I mean this, that God takes an interest in his people. And so the point is this, interest for those who call. Look what it says in verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears towards their cry. Friends, David had been through some horrific circumstances. We've thought about that. And in many ways, he still wasn't out of them. But in the midst of them, he knew that God hadn't forgotten him. God cared for him. God's eyes were upon him and his ears were attentive. Our God is a personal God, a knowable God, a responsive God. You might be feeling like no one understands you at the moment, that no one knows your fears. But friends, God does. His eyes are on you and his ears are attentive to your cry. He has an interest in those that call upon him. He has an interest in you. Next up, the letter S, and the word here is support. Uh, God supports those in need. There is support for those in need. It says this in verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Now, this builds on what we just saw. God has an interest in us, but actually it goes beyond an interest. He actually supports us. He walks alongside us in our brokenness with our crushed spirits. God is there with us. You know, sometimes people criticise Christianity for being for weak people. We are, you only have that faith because you're weak. You're, you need some kind of crutch to lean on because you're not strong enough to stand on your own. But do you know what a situation like the coronavirus shows us? That actually we're not strong enough to stand on our own. We are weak, each one of us, and we need a strong God. We are weak and needy people. And to those that come to God and admit, God, I am weak and I need you, he comes right near to our broken hearts and saves us when we're crushed in spirit. Now for David, this was astonishingly good news that God draws near to those that are broken hearted. He didn't need to act in any way before God. He didn't need to act as though he was all together to come before God. When he was in front of King Abimelech, he had to act to be someone that he wasn't really. But when he came into the presence of God, he could come honestly, showing who he was. Lord, I am a broken man. And friends, you might be feeling broken today, but God accepts and indeed desires us to come as weak and broken people. God offers support for those in need. The final letter is E, and my final point is this, there is embrace for those in him. When I, mean, when I say in him, I mean those who belong to God. There is embrace for those who are in him. Our God brings us to himself, not to condemn us, but to embrace us and give us refuge. So verse 22 says this, the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Friends, God offers us redemption instead of condemnation. We, by nature, deserve condemnation. We deserve to be far from God because of the choices we make. But when we come to God seeking his mercy, he doesn't condemn us. He offers redemption to us. 
Now, no doubt when David wrote this, he was thinking primarily of his own circumstances, but we live after the time of Jesus and we see the greatest redemption of all. We see the Son of God who came down from heaven on our behalf, who died in our place as a substitute to bring us back to God in order that we might not face judgment, but we might face the embracing of God. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Friends, even in the midst of this awful coronavirus situation, which we all wish and pray would go away, let us never forget that if our hope is truly in Christ, then he has delivered us from something much worse than this pandemic. He has delivered us from God's judgment. And he's brought us into something that is more wonderful than we can describe. He's lined up for us a glorious heavenly home, which is far greater than anything this world can offer. And so the Apostle Paul can say these words in Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Friends, we may not know what the immediate future holds, but praise God for the fact that if our hope is in Christ, there is no condemnation for us and our eternity will be spent in glorious perfection with a glorious body in the presence of a glorious saviour. Friends, what a God we have. As I close, I ask us, do we share David's deep-rooted commitment to praising God in every season of our life? Can we say like him, I will bless the Lord at all times? Friends, when we have that kind of attitude, our fears will start to go and we will indeed see and taste that the Lord is good. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for being so constant, Lord, in a world that it seems so out of control. We know that it is not, that you are the one who is lovingly guiding it. And Lord, we thank you for the truths that are found in this great psalm, Lord, that you are the God of salvation, that you are the God who draws near to the brokenhearted. And Lord, as we enter this new week, I pray for my brothers and sisters that you might surround them with a sense of your goodness and your presence. Surround them with a sense that you have not abandoned them, but you are with them. Lord, may we go into this week as people who praise you. In the ups and downs of lives, may we be able to say like David, I will bless the, the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. And we pray all these things in the strong and precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, just a few uh, things to mention before we end. First, uh, just to let you know um, where I'm going with the preaching. Next Sunday, God willing, uh, we enter Holy Week at the beginning of it as, as it's Palm Sunday. So I plan to, to speak on, on, on that triumphal entry on that Sunday and then the following Sunday, of course, to preach on the Easter story. And the other thing I hope to do is just make some videos for each day of that Holy Week, just narrating what went on uh, during Christ's week between his entry and his resurrection, just as a way of, of helping us really get into the Easter story. Some of us perhaps have more time than usual and, and can give that time to really thinking through what happened to Christ in his final week. And finally, just to say we have got um, some online prayer meetings set up. There's one immediately after this at 11.30. The link is in the email. Uh, there's also one on Monday night at eight o'clock and one uh, on Friday mornings at 7.15. And we would so love for you to join us as you're able. If you can't make those prayer meetings, do make sure, though, that you are in prayer. Pray for our government, particularly our prime minister at this time. Pray for uh, uh, the, the, the NHS as they are, are seeking to serve and help those around us. Pray for those who are unwell. Pray uh, for those who are fearful about finances, whatever you know, whatever needs you know, bring them before the Lord and ask him to work. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Take care and God bless.
Blessed be your name. Blessed. 